Okay, Mark, can you can you use the slides? Absolutely. So thank you very much, Christiana. So let's hopefully uh, see if I can get this to work. So what we I thought I'd do is to basically start off with the background to cloud computing, uh, just starting to step back a bit and just remind ourselves that we're obviously now in the year 2016 and that um, Commuted. computing probably could arguably be been around for probably at least 10 years as a kind of dialogue in the marketplace and maybe you could trace this back to earlier uh, given the genesis of salesforce.com for example or indeed um, you know, the early stages of um, how utility computing may have been described. Um, in terms of the size of the market, I was asked to just briefly comment, we'll probably come back to this in later slides, um, but certainly you know, most analysts are sort of saying that the global size of the cloud computing consultancy services market is around $160 billion. Uh, I think for next year, uh, um, I was advised it probably might grow to about $200 billion. It is a significant market. And that's just the consulting service. If you look at one of the one of the cloud vendors, and, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily um, saying that this is just for this. You know, Amazon Cloud, which is well known as a as a, a major major cloud provider in the public cloud, particularly. Um, they last quarter in Q4 2015 did uh, 2.8 billion dollars. So they're basically turning about 8 billion dollars a year. So this is Amazon alone, and then of course there are many, many other technologies out in the cloud that we're going to just briefly talk about. So it's significant. I mean, if you look at the typical business model, um, most industry experts say that probably about 40, 30 to 40 percent of a business IT operation can certainly move into a cloud environment, whether public, private, or hybrid. Um, Typically, uh, this could be moved up to 50 to 60 percent of most business processes could be operating in some kind of cloud platform. So the concept of that, whether you purchase the cloud as a service or you're architecting the cloud, the choice of make or buy or reuse um, are significantly uh, within the, the major uh, strategy of, uh, of IT, whether you're a small company or a medium-sized company or a large company. So cloud. Clearly, that what we're talking about today is about cloud architecture. It is a significant uh, part of a IT strategy in any organisation that, that we we talk about. If we uh, just briefly talk about um, questions, please ask questions. Just put them in the comments if you if you want to ask a question. Please do. Um, we're going to have a Q and A at the end, as as, as we've been told. But please do ask. Um, you know, hopefully, I'll try and keep the flow going um, but, and keep it a bit bouncy and interesting because we've got to go for quite a while. But I'm going to take you through the philosophy of the cloud. What's the point of cloud computing? Then, as we say, we'll walk through some of the aspects of the modules of what we're actually teaching in the cloud certification course. But then finally, we'll go through um, you know some specific details of the curriculum, so you kind of get a feel for what what the professional cloud solutions architecture certificate will, will give you and how it adds to your career hopefully. So one of the things I'd, I'd like to remind ourselves with cloud computing on this slide is it really is, you know, what is cloud computing? Essentially which, which really made me first aware of what cloud was, it's about elasticity, it's about being able to provision faster than you would normally do if you were um, basically having to go and buy hardware or software and be able to provision the service. And um, one of the things that we um, find with cloud computing, with elasticity models, um, is that that is a major feature. And so we're going from maybe uh, weeks or even months even down to potentially minutes or hours or, or seconds in some cases in being able to provision IT resources. The second thing is really the transformation around CapEx and OpEx. CapEx is capital expenditure and operational expenditure, the running of the service in IT, is you get a transformation around that in the sense that you don't have to invest in IT, you can invest in, in subscribing to the service and you basically can change the mix of investment in capital, capital expenditure to operational expenditure. This is again another big feature of cloud computing. 
And finally, really, the one thing that um, I would say that's quite important is it's about understanding how, bis how the strategic sourcing and governance works in your organization, not only the cybersecurity issues, which are significant, and how cloud can potentially open up new governance issues because, it, because you're using an external, potentially an externally hosted um, environment, cloud environment. But I'd say the fundamental thing about cloud computing, it's being able to run your business in a different way. If you're an architect and you're looking at the existing business processes or looking at the existing enterprise architecture, is how can you change your business to exploit the elasticity model of the cloud, to exploit the changing operating cost and performance, to be able to use self-service and agility. Because with cloud, you can stand up much faster, a system much faster, you can potentially be more adaptive, you can develop and test things slightly faster or even significantly faster, or you can source different solutions through APIs and marketplaces. And the question you have to ask yourself as an architect, as a consultant, you know, or if you're advising a client, is how which, which cloud service would fit their business model? But more importantly, it's not just taking the old business processes and just moving them into the cloud and just running the business as it, as it was before. Ideally, what you're doing is you're trying to transform, trans, tr transfer and transform how those business processes may be more elastic, may be able to respond to new customers and products and processes, be able to offer different types of customer experience and services because the cloud allows you to give, let's say, big data services, it allows you to do more mobile computing, allows you to offer up more product capability. So this is the mindset that I find with cloud is it's not just a technology change, a technology shift, but it's actually a business process or a business model paradigm shift. It's moving from the virtualization world into the on-demand business model world, which is the thing that sits on top of virtualization, let's say, to become a cloud business solution for, for, for that operational or, or operating model. So the role of the architect is really fundamentally to be able to basically understand how to transform business models, how to um, architect the way um, that agility can be brought about, how cost reduction, most organizations may see cloud as a way of perhaps moving more of their operating costs to an OPEX model to try and reduce the total cost of ownership of IT to maybe think about the different skills in the IT department or the business and how, how they could actually optimize their use of IT. But it's not just about, as I said, the old model moving to the cloud, but how to use the strategic capabilities and the skills that you need are not just technical or architecture design, but also about business model design as well. How does cloud work? So fundamentally, cloud changes the game, changes the way to think about um, the, the architecture. So I'm just looking for um, the next uh, slide. Just let me click on to the next one. Historically, one of the things that um, I found when I went back and thought about um, cloud computing is that um, for me, this journey, um, let me just, um, get these slides back. Um, for me, the story around this was really understanding back in the 2000 and before, in the 1990s, we had business process re-engineering with, with Hammer and others, if, you, if you're familiar with that uh, methodology. Then entered enterprise, uh, enterprise um, application integration, EAI. And then we had the early utility computing models at, back in the beginning of the 2000, the first decade of the, of the, of the second millennium. An ASP, application service um, providers, was, was the vogue then. Then around 2003, we started to see the story of Web 2.0 becoming uh, people aware of web, web services. Um, how would you create a um, web service exchange between websites? And then, of course, the explosion of SOA, service oriented architecture, where the abstraction of of modularity, if you will, between the physical architecture and the logical architecture was separated out into a service contract, into a service catalog. And that was the genesis of SOA, and that was the genius, as I used to call it, and still do, of SOA, was the separation of concerns of physical and logical. But the challenge with all of that was really around uh, being able to have the dynamic runtime binding, to use the architecture phrase, where the architecture was responsive enough to actually be able to deliver those services on demand. And that's the big difference between uh, SOA and cloud, was cloud introduced this idea of being able to put a business model on top of SOA, if you will, and SOA and cloud are 
synergistic, they do work together. The, the principles of SOA are, are principles of a deployment model, if you will, or a design model of cloud. And this was something in, in the paper, the famous paper, as I call it, the Berkeley um, Above the Cloud paper that came out in 2009 was a, a significant paper for me because it started to break down the challenges and opportunities of the cloud, thinking about how you could start to put a business model around it. Another paper in 2009 that I particularly like to quote is this idea of multiplicity. And what we mean by that is being able to clone your operating uh, container, if you will, your virtual container in a and put it into a hosted environment and then you could replicate that and move it around and you could start to clone that and then run it on a mobile device. And so the concept started to really grow in terms of modularity, moving uh, uh, virtual containers around and, and starting to become more like a cloud thinking process around 2009-2010. Obviously, the NIST, which is the American uh, National Institute for Standards, um, around 2011 and 12 started to develop um, the uh, reference architecture that became the def sort of de facto cloud computing reference model that was published around 2012. Um, that included um, a number of famous, as I call it, um, statements around uh, uh, software as a service platform as a service and into, into, uh, infrastructure as a service, and obviously public, private, community, and hybrid cloud, and obviously the five characteristics of cloud computing, which was, um, if I just move this particular thing out of the way, it was on-demand access, uh, measured service, broad uh, app network access, resource pooling, and rapid elastic environments. So the foundations were there, and then it wasn't until around 2014 when ISO, the International Standards for IT, then based on the work by NIST and other organizations and standards body, then produced the ISO 17788 um, standard, also the Institute for Telecoms uh, published uh, the same paper endorsing it, was the cloud computing's reference architecture and vocabulary that came out in 2014. So it became a recognized uh, mainstream reference architecture. So that's a kind of a quick 101 on the history. So we are now two years beyond that point, and now starting to think about what is cloud computing really going to? Where is it growing? We've now got the reference architecture standards. We're starting to see more adoption maturing in the organizations and across all industry sectors. And I use this diagram as part of the introduction. We're now moving into the exabyte era. Um, exabyte areas, I think, in terms of internet traffic is around uh, you know, one exabyte uh, per month. Um, I think the forecast is going up to 40 to or to 100 e uh, exabytes uh, by the by the end of this year. And really, the volume of data, the the ability to connect devices and to be able to create lots of different um, services around the internet, uh, the network, uh, the devices, the data, joining those all up, and the ability of cloud to provide computation on demand to provide storage on demand, to connect up your devices, which are not just mobile devices, tablets, but also now the Internet of Things, and uh, big data and analytics and so on and so on and so forth. So the narrative of um, the cloud computing story hasn't stopped. But it clearly is going on into the, into the future. We're now moving into a much larger scaling up of social media websites, much larger scaling up of how this is affecting uh, jobs, skills, the way we design customer experience, how we change our infrastructure and, and processes. So it's now mature, it's really bringing together lots of things. Um, as I said, the SPI model that was uh, invented, if you will, by uh, the NIST um, is now really extending out. You just look at um, microservice you can get on Dropbox, or you look at the one terabyte um, storage that you can get with a Microsoft cloud for commodity services. Lots and lots of vendors are now moving into the space of being able to create infrastructures as a service. It's almost like a commodity now. And then you have extremes of that where you need to have very high uh, data storage, which could be for high performance computing or big data warehousing. Then you look at PaaS, you look at DevOps, this continuous development. If you look at most software um, development houses now, they look at agile computing, agile development lifecycle. DevOps of joining up the development with the production, linking it together is fundamental in the way IT operates today. Software as a service, commodity, dev, custom, the idea of modularity, 
it's now quite normal to go and look at an application store or to look at a open source uh, DevOps environment and start to think about what sort of software could I use from different software as a service providers. And again, if you look at large enterprise architecture platforms, or you look at CRM or product lifecycle management, or all of the major uh, business process categories, most of these now have a large software as a service catalog, if you will, of functionality and vendors and solutions. So the role of the architect is really trying to get their, your head around all of that and to bring it all together. And lots of new models. I mean, it's, it didn't just end in 2014. It's not just IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. Even if you look at the ISO model, reference model, they're now talking about uh, mobile cloud. So how do you get your mobile uh, connecting with, with cloud services? If you look at speech translation, some of you may be listening to this particular talk on your mobile phones, and you'll be using, say, voice over the internet. I'm using VoIP services right now. So this is a mobile service connecting to a cloud service, if you will. Content delivery, you look at Netflix, you look at streaming of your newspapers or your video content. It's, it's very widespread. A really big significant one, of course, is software-defined network. The idea of uh, the earlier genesis of that was uh, MPLS, which is um, the ability to take your uh, telecoms infrastructure network, your LAN, your WAN, and your wireless and other uh, corporate infrastructure of networks and to basically virtualize those and offer them as a cloud service, as a network as a service. And it's not just the software-defined network, it's now software-defined data centers even, where it all becomes a kind of modular on-demand cloud architecture principle. So big data, appliances, machine-to-machine -machine learning, uh, high-performance computing, Lots of other workloads, as we call them, workloads, are now starting to evolve beyond just the IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. So again, as the architecture role and what we cover in the, um, in the course, in the module, uh, sorry, the, the set of modules with the professional cloud computing um, certification, is to think about all those different types of workloads, the vertical workloads, the horizontal workloads, as I, as I call them, and then how you bring those together and what type of workloads fit for the type of business solution or business problem that the, your, your customer or your business um, sponsor is looking for. What's happening now is uh, one of the professors at the university I'm a part-time was a really great quote that I like is he said that competition has gone to the ecosystem and I said to him well what does that mean we had a paper written about it a couple of years ago and he said what's happening is that when vendors are choosing or when IT architects or business people are choosing you're choosing between an Android uh, ecosystem an Android store or a, uh, an Apple iOS store for example the analogy there is you're kind of joining the club of, of apps that are available in a particular community, online community. And you do this with social media, you do this with, with content or books or services from a marketplace. And the idea is that you're almost competing with, with collections of, of cloud-based hosted services now. It's not just individual services, you now have this expectation as a consumer, as an enterprise um, user of IT services, that you have a almost like a smorgasbord, a collection of services to, to, to choose from. This is again the power of the ecosystem. Crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, you look at crowd in, it, in its widest sense of um, either crowd development of, of open source or crowd behavior on social media or crowd development in big data collection and sharing is it now a very powerful business model crowd sourcing of ideas of innovation all enabled through cloud computing technology and again open source and uh, be able to post things into the cloud and to to monetize so the world that we're in now as I said is really a, a very uh, different one than uh, back in the early uh, first decade of, uh, of 2000s and that we've seen that the genesis of the cloud reference architecture move away from IaaS, PaaS and SaaS into business process as a service, as industry as a service, which are kind of concepts of how these things can be created as a set of business models. And then the idea of cloud management, being able to actually um, develop services beyond just the, uh, the business capabilities, but how do you run the security management of the cloud environment? 
how do you develop performance management of a cloud environment, how do you develop integration across different cloud or non-cloud environments. So I just in those three points I've just made, again, of fundamental issues for a cloud solutions architect is to know what is the security architecture, what is the integration architecture, what is the kind of governance and management of services, and what are the charging mechanisms for the cloud, how are we going to make that work not just from a contractual point of view, but how are we going to bring these things together? And then mobile computing, big data computing, network carrier cloud computing, how do we bring all of these new layers of the technology stack into our portfolio of extensions? And again, we have these choices, not only private cloud deployment models or community cloud, community cloud, if we just, just remind ourselves about NIST and its definition of that, is a community it could be a private community within your particular supply chain of your enterprise. How do you grow a collaboration platform to grow a community of shared cloud resources? Or it could be a community outside your organization, but it's a community of interest. And then public cloud, cloud which you're sharing with other tenants that not necessarily within your own organization. The private cloud would usually typically within a particular enterprise um, um, user. Hybrid cloud is a combination of one or more public or private or community clouds. And now we're starting to see new definitions which have been around for a number of years now, which is the partner cloud, where you may have a public cloud provider offering a private, uh, a virtual private cloud, a VPC inside the public cloud, just dedicated just for a particular customer client. So you have partnerships with cloud providers. And then the broker cloud, or an orchestrator if you will, where um, you're using a cloud broker to orchestrate connections between different types of cloud resources. And again, this is a concept which is, is, is appealing to the system integration services of how do you broker these things and being able to swap in and swap out different types of cloud workloads and different types of architecture solutions. So very interesting and um, I'd say this is part of the language of what the solution architect needs to understand. and. Um, Part of the uh, the story that we, we we're trying to grow in this um, in this uh, solution architecture model. Uh, just trying to move to the next slide, which is here. Um, we need to think about really the journey that we need to take uh, the business on. And um, what we have here is again this idea on this slide is is knowing where on premise or off premise needs to work. So the role to say what the architect is trying to do is to look at the to be the owner of the architecture design principles to understand where we're going to put the cloud footprint. This particular slide is, um, is um, starting to uh, let's see, move on to the next one. Is then uh, how do we put cloud management into that environment? How do we migrate from virtualized hosting environments? And how do we scale up? What's the sort of continuous um, architecture do we need to put in place? How do we select which particular cloud solution uh, architecture do we need to put in place? So this is just the initial concepts that I'm showing you here. But you, you start to hopefully get the idea that we're moving away from technical services but into a combination of technical and business services to meet particular business requirements. So there's lots and lots of cloud services out there. And this is just my one of my favorite slides is really just showing that there's lots and lots of uh, four letter or five letter acronyms as we say. It's not just the old IS, PaaS, and SaaS. We've got data as a service, desktop as a service, or content delivery as a service. We've got compliance as a service, carrier as a service. Uh, the ISO standard, interestingly, does have carrier as a service uh, to recognize the role of telecoms in the traditional sense. Uh, again, one of the things that I would say the cloud does is it kind of blends and merges the old definitions of storage and compute and uh, desktop and networks, so you start to bring it together as a kind of unified architecture experience now because everything can be virtualized. Another one there is DevOps and communications and sensors and, and sensor meshes with the Internet of Things and agents uh, starting to become connected to the cloud and Hadoop, which is obviously a, a famous um, big data um, um, platform is now hosted in the cloud. It's not the only uh, hosted environment. So lots and lots of things going on in the cloud. And this is really, again, I would say this is your paint box. This is your toolkit as an architect to start to think about how these cloud-enabled services, all those cloud, cloud uh, characteristics that I mentioned earlier, how are they actually going to work and how do they fit the business requirements? 
lots and lots of vendors out there in the market. I'm not saying these are the only vendors. I'm just giving them. I would also say that this is not saying that they are in those particular positions. Um, what you will find, that particularly with, you know, with IBM, with Accenture or Deloitte or Tata or whoever, Oracle, Microsoft, uh, you name it. A lot of these companies now, either through partnerships or through their own portfolio of cloud services, are able to offer many, many of these kind, kind of capabilities. All I'm trying to say here is that sometimes some of the specialisms would be perhaps around the digital strategy or the cloud strategy or maybe around um, managing the overall transformation of the business, whereas if you look at, say, more what I would call, child, I call them children born in the cloud, I mean that in a caring way, so you look at Twitter, Facebook, Google, you know, Amazon, eBay, all those famous um, well-known um, cloud um, environments, and I'm just giving you the, uh, just purely examples. Um, you know, they, they start off in the cloud and they kind of have a mindset and culture that is all driven by that cloud architecture. Again, you look at the services, you know, Dropbox, PayPal, Skype, you know, I could go on. I'm just giving examples here. There's not the only ones. You know, uh, yesterday I was in a student's lecture and it was very interesting. You know, even for a small company which may have just, say, three three uh, shops and, and maybe say 20, 20, 20 people working for that company, there are lots and lots of niche applications now that are either open source or they're very, very cheap. You're talking a few hundred dollars. I'm not saying iCloud is just a few hundred dollars, but there's so many different things to choose from. And I would say again, the role of the business of the solution architect is trying to understand how the appropriate functionality can fit the capability and size of the organization. Again, with the original equipment manufacturers there on the left, you know, we see the genesis of the, the, the older companies. You look at what Intel, IBM, Oracle, so on and so forth, EMC, the acquisition of VMware and what have you, HP, and all the other well-known companies out there. There's lots and lots of opportunities now to drive lots and lots of um, taking your hardware and software and your skills and your people, moving them into a more cloud-capable delivery service. So even if you're offering business process outsourcing or business process tasks or micro-sourcing or even if you're just doing software development or you're offering big data services, all of these things I just spoke about could be hosted in the cloud environment, offered elastically offered it with a different type of subscription model. So you move from a capital uh, capex investment to a potential annuity model, if you will, of service delivery. And, and this creates a kind of what I call a feedback loop that with your customers that you're potentially always connected through the cloud and you can start to architect new types of joined up experiences. And I find that quite interesting because it's not like a project delivery waterfall cycle. We're now in the era of lean, we're in the era of cost reduction, we're in the era of not only Six Sigma, which is operating, opportun uh, developing opportunities for cost reduction and efficiencies, but we're also in the era of, of agility, agile, uh, you know, scrum and things like that. And all of these Agile and Scrum, you know, I go back to the early 2000s, we talk about utility computing and SOA, I couldn't do that because the architecture just wasn't the same, didn't have the agility to be able to, to be on-demand self-service. Now we have a catch-up, if you of IT in the cloud being able to be elastic and responsive to the business in a way that it was intended to do. So you have the Agile business development cycle of multiple iterative development and delivery cycles and an agile cloud environment that can be responsive in the same speed and agility. So the two have come together. Finally, finally in 2016 and beyond, we're now connected. And what I'm expecting to see in the future, which we'll talk about later, is where is this all leading to with the ecosystem development. So it's really down to creativity, down to having the skills in the organization, not only from your vendors, but also if you, in, as, a, as, a, as a, you know, the reason you're hopefully listening to this, is the sort of skills you're looking for and to develop is to be able to start to define requirements with that cloud philosophy, with that cloud mindset. And this is just a slide briefly that is trying to pitch some of the questions you might want to think about. You know, how do I need to communicate to stakeholders and investors what the value of cloud is? How do I develop a business case? How do I manage the vendor selection? How do I oversee the quality and governance to the reference model? 
How do I find define cloud requirements? How do I develop a solution architecture? How do I basically procure and oversee the implementation? This is what the uh, professional cloud solutions architect course is trying to do. It's trying to take you through that journey. It's trying to split up the business artifacts with the IT artifacts, just to be clear what an artifact is. It's really a specification, to put it simply, or a set of design principles or, um, or um, specifications, as I said, which help you define what the cloud is. So again, if we just build that out for a minute, from a technology point of view, it's about the demand and supply. Because you can buy IT on demand, or you can source it or manage it to your tenants, if you will. You can start to plan your supply and demand and fine tune what you're paying for. So you're only buying and subscribing to what you need, not having a, an overcapacity or undercapacity issue, hopefully. You have a portfolio approach to your IT. IT becomes a set of service catalogs or service processes. You look at your configuration management and licensing in a different way. You look at your vision, you know, importantly, you try to reimagine your business, as I said earlier in my introduction, in, the, in a way that elasticity, on demand, and agile uh, capabilities that are the things that we want to aspire to. How can IT and cloud be brought together to be able to give new business experiences, new business capabilities, new scalability, if you will, and agility? And uh, just move on to the next slide. Another one, you know, from a uh, IT artifacts point of view, is how do we design our API strategy so we can connect to different services uh, internally or externally? How can we start to manage environments? How can we? What standards should we use if we want to start to port uh, to portability and interoperability? Portability and interoperability is one of the, in my view one of the fundamental skills of, a, of an architect is how do you understand the modularity? How do you do the separation of concerns? How do you think about the migration and architecture of, of the cloud uh, from different from one system to another? How can you do... Another one is interesting is the terms and conditions, the licensing. So it's not just a technical skill set, but what are the kind of commercial uh, technical questions you need to ask, and the security and, and, ex, and ex, a, a, you know, backup and recovery, and the service level agreements that you want to put in place to maintain the and preserve the quality of, of service of, and reliability and security of the cloud environment. These are all questions that the, the architect is um, uniquely placed, I would argue, to bring together. And this is just a diagram which I quite like around showing where the skills have shifted. What we find is that if you're using external cloud providers, we're starting to start to consider how do we need to connect to um, cloud providers who are going to provide some of the services that you may have done originally in-house. And it's not to kind of ignore or just delegate the service to an external provider, but be aware that maybe internally you need to have more monitoring systems in place to start to manage the cloud environment uh, service levels as a black box, if you will. And then internally, what new skills do I need if I'm starting to use a cloud provider and I'm a customer, I'm, I'm an architect inside a business who's consuming the cloud from an external cloud provider? What type of responses and um, and monitoring do I need to make sure that that external cloud provider is providing the kind of service that they were offering and committing to deliver as part of their service level agreement? So. Lots of specifications need to be thought about. It's, it's kind of understanding. Uh, I, I just use four key documents. It's by no means the only four documents that, that should be developed. But I'm just giving you a flavor of the, the skills that we try to develop on the certification course. Is that we need to think about the top left-hand corner, the purchase and, purchase and subscription models. Yeah, what type of subscription models are available today? What, this impacts the service level agreements. Then the user experience, um, because of the genesis now, we're now in what we call the digital era. Uh, you know, is cloud now called digital, which is an interesting debate we could have, is that we're now thinking about how does cloud enable you to develop um, end user experience? You know, how do we develop customer experience using cloud technology? And then on the blue, uh, the green box rather, um, the business technology cloud specification is what is the technical reference architecture from a business point of view for the cloud? How do you design your solution reference architecture? And we have that in the course. And then finally, the purple box at the bottom right-hand corner 
is how do we develop um, service security within and compliance within the specification. If you're in the medical sector, for example, you may have HIPAA standards for FDA approval, and you may want to look at other standards, say, if you're in the banking and financial services, or if you're in retail, or in chemical industry, or in insurance industry, or what have you. There will be different types of data specifications in which data needs to be stored in the cloud and maintained and managed and archived and things like this. And these again, all specifications that need to serve. So let's just um, step back a minute and think about really the things that uh, a solution architect needs to think about. So on this diagram, I just tried to raise some of the questions. Um, you know starting around this, and these are by no means the only ones, is that we need to really think about the holistic model. So the role of an architect is not just compared to the developer or comparing the role of the architect to, say, traditional architects, and I, I prefer not to use that as, as discrimination between a traditional architect and a cloud architect. I'm just saying that with a cloud architecture approach is really thinking about the device connectivity thinking what types of controls do we need for on-demand services, the sort of service catalog, or level of security, because we start to think about how do we need to do encryption or identity management but from an external to internal cloud uh, connection point of view. What type of channels do we want to use to consume the cloud? Because today we often have this phrase called um, um, you know, multi-channel, uh, so it could be on a tablet, a mobile phone, it could be BYOD, bring your own device. How does that connect? And then do we want to connect to certain uh, social media channels? Um, you know, maybe we need to have some controls about what people are putting up on social media. You know, is, it, is it going to impact your brand and be misleading with, with the way that some of these social media may be, may be used? What level of, of tenancy isolation? Do we want to have certain types of our data which is very secure and private. It could be medical data, it could be personal records, it could be you know, uh, national security records. We may want to keep those in a private cloud or even not on a cloud. We may want it in a secure uh, physical environment, which is under tight security because it's a secure uh, data managed environment. We don't want to have that in a shared environment. More level of partitioning. And then what kind of system integration do we want? How do we join things together with APIs, integration? What systems need to be connected? And how do we bring that to work in one cloud? Or maybe have multiple clouds we want to connect? So really, um, let me just um, move to here. So a number of the questions you may need to think about is, how do I develop um, the, uh, the critical questions so around standards? around legal contract requirements. You know, if you're subscribing to a service, there may be a one-year subscription period, or you may subscribe by month, or you may be subscribing by the number of uh, concurrent users that can use that cloud service. So there's lots of questions around subscription models. Again, transition tools. What tools do the cloud provider have in terms of migrating your old data or your old system into this new cloud environment? Or moving from one cloud environment to a new cloud environment? You know, what what are the critical architecture decisions? What are the capabilities and features do you need to think about? Steps in that journey might be the device strategy. It doesn't necessarily have to be in this sequence from left to right. It could be a number of these. Often with cloud is thinking about what type of user experience do you want to ge generate with your cloud architecture? Where is the user going to be using the cloud? What are the touch points? What are the type of devices do we need to plug into this? What is the sort of network architecture coverage do we need? Do we have the right performance bandwidth to pass the type of data volumes back and forth from the device to the service, uh, to the hosting environment to the cloud? Front-end cloud strategy, who owns the catalogs? Do we want a shared catalog? Do you want to have a public catalog of services to our consumers or our partners in, in the vendor's supply chain? What type of marketplace do we want to use? Do we want to use third-party marketplaces? Do we want to build our own marketplace of B2B or B2C or portals um, or employee portals for collaboration. What type of back-end integration do we want? How do we want to manage our APIs, our data synchronization, uh, our hosting options? Where do we want to have this data? Where do we need to have it located? Does it need to be on our country sovereignty or do we want it to be federated across multiple countries where we have different factories or different shops or 
different business operations that need to share or collaborate or, or control access to common data. So these things are all part of the cloud and all part of the architecture of a modern cloud solution, which um, the, the architect is uniquely placed to, to start to think about. Again, the architect needs to start thinking about the kind of design architectures. Now, what are these sort of components? This is just a concept diagram here, but you get the idea, hopefully, in terms of the cloud platform, the integration. So one of the things I want to say that about the uh, professional um, cloud uh, solutions architect certification is that we're, we're, we are vendor agnostic. We do use a number of different examples from vendors in terms of cloud solutions, but the concept of the course is that it brings in real professional experience of implementing and designing cloud solutions, but allows you to start to unpick and, and look at the basic skills that you need as a practitioner if you're looking to use the, this certification course to give you uh, an accelerated knowledge of speaking cloud architecture, then this will do it. It will get you to start to think about the language of cloud architecture, like these boxes here. It will get you to start to break that down into the front-end cloud platform. What are the kind of mobile services you're looking to deliver to your customers or your end users? It will start to get you to think about the type of marketplaces and um, services will then start to create um, the sort of integration, what type of development environment, do you just want to buy a service completely uh, 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 configurable with no developments, might be one thing, or you may say, well, we need to do a lot of customization development, so we need to look at our PaaS environment, our platform as a service, our DevOps environment, if you will. And then the back end is, do you want to host this on your own premises or off premises, do you want to have it in a shared or public cloud, or or a hybrid cloud on-premise and off-premise. Again, what are the management systems around this? As I said earlier, the, the cloud management could be the self-service, the metering and billing, the virtualization, if you're migrating from virtualization to the cloud and back again. What security management tools do you need in place? What performance optimization tools? In the course, we cover all these aspects of thinking through, thinking through end-to-end what makes a professional cloud solution architecture work? And this is what this is about. And then again, you know, what is the role of the solution provider in that? Do they do all of it or part of it? What does a broker do? What's the difference between a, a broker and a, and, a, and a hoster? I mean, how do they? What are the differences? We talk about that in the course. And system integrators. What is the role of the system integrator? How do they integrate all these different components together to make a, a unified service end to end? This integration is, is not trivial. I mean, this is just a concept diagram, again, but it is sort of one of the, it's from the course. And what we're trying to do here is start to really explore out the sort of services that are important in cloud integration and, and services, and we start to explore the different aspects of, of the front and back end systems and how do we bring them together. Again, a number of questions, and this is just the matrix that we start to talk about in the course is um, around um, you know, what sort of strategies, maybe you know, when do we use a private cloud compared to a public cloud? When do we use um, platform as a service for, um, you know, for open source compared to maybe using uh, a set of functionality that's developed by, a, by the software as a service company itself? And lots of questions. So. Um, in terms of um, where this is all going, it's really, really trying to understand um, a lot of these questions, and I'm just trying to move on to the next slide, if it'll let me, uh, which hopefully it will do, thank you. Um, and then, of course, then other, other types of workloads. We talk about mobility, big data, integration, and uh, content delivery. And this is, again, you know, do we want to do it over the mobile device, or do we want to have a, a laptop solution, or do we want to have a you know, what type of big data workflows are we, are we developing? And, um, and again, uh, this is just illustrative of the type of use cases that we explore in the, uh, uh, um, you know, the service uh, levels of the cloud and where the modern cloud of 2016 and beyond, is that we're starting to really try to understand the role of these new um, mobile services, integration services and big data services. So, what I'd like to do now is just um, 
stop a second, but to to start to I've, what I've done in that last um, seg segment and uh, is just taking you through really uh, just the cloud and the kind of kind of ideas that we teach on the course. What I'd like to do now is just talk a little bit about what is the actual certification itself. So if you choose to go on or teach, if you want to deliver this uh, certification course, or if you want to actually sit the course and um, use it as a kind of um, baseline to your building your skills as an architect for the cloud services. What this um, course does is it's intended to help you, it's designed to be able to give you um, the language, the practitioner language of cloud computing. So it's not a technology uh, course, it's not teaching you specific open stack technologies or, or Docker, Docker micro container strategies, it's not a detailed technical architecture course, this is a business systems architecture course that teaches you the language and vocabulary of cloud computing. It's designed to take people who have let's say complementary skills in technology, design, application design, system architects or, or consultants enable them, and then enable them to, to sort of in a short space of time of a few days of when we run this course to allow them to accelerate quickly with the type of language and skills that they need to, to start to design and think about cloud as a business solution strategy, as a business solution architecture. So what we do in this course is to um, start to, um, if I can get to the next slide, is to go through a series of modules. We go through the history, it's got um, I think 12 modules or 11 modules, 12 modules, I um, can't quite remember the number. Uh, over uh, I think it's usually three days, um, we will go through the history of cloud computing just to baseline where we are. We then talk about the different types of make, buy and rent models of, of how how cloud can change the dynamic of capex and opex purchasing and the agility of the business. Module three, we, we talk about the all of the essential technology engineering vocabulary of cloud computing. So we cover really the whole technology stack of, of cloud. We look at the different aspects of that. So it's not a, as I said, a deep technical uh, deep dive into the architecture of cloud because technology deployment models are different for, for different vendors. It's looking at the more the logical and physical technology components that make up the cloud environment. And then in module four and five and six, we then develop um, really the layers of the solution architecture. We, we go through in some detail in module four, the different types of reference architectures. As an enterprise solution uh, cloud architect, you are expected, I would say, to understand different reference architectures for cloud, for data, for security, and how do you bring those together in your architecture model. We then look at standards within that as well, so you get a, 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 a refresher and a, a vocabulary of what standards are important in cloud. Then we talk about the service life cycle. We start to break that down into different types of life cycles in module five. In module six, we look at the business transformation. So it's not just the module five IT transformation life cycle. We're also about the business transformation cycle itself. So we talk about practitioner concerns and issues as a business solutions, uh, sorry, a cloud solutions architect, is how do you start to think about the business transformation to the cloud. Um, module eight and nine then starts to um, uh, well module module eight and module seven I should say really uh, breaks down the setting up of the cloud environment so module eight is a, a seven sorry module eight rather on the slide there is about setting up a cloud environment from a provider perspective so a cloud provider cloud environment what are the standards and architecture components we would expect to see there. In module seven, previously we would talk about setting up the client environment from the consumer side, the customer consumer side. Module uh, nine is about, then goes into the cloud ecosystem, how do you start to think about the broad picture. And then finally with module 11 and 10, as we then talk about detailed design and also build, developing your business case, your return on investment case and your total cost of ownership for a cloud business solution. So we teach you how to put together a business case for a cloud. So overall the exam at the end of it is uh, we have a, an exam. Uh, all through the modules by the way you get practice questions of the exam paper so it's um, 
we spend a lot of time rehearsing and reinforcing the learning so hopefully it's a, it's a pleasant experience and then what we do is we then run a, a multiple choice question exam which uh, you see there is 75 minutes long and um, then the idea here is you can then uh, get a certification passing the exam you get a certificate with that so lots of career path opportunities lots of different directions lots of things about as I said on the slides I'm just sort of moving towards the end of the session now in the last part of the, the section is really talking about understanding how to set up environments so you may ask the question, well, what is the professional architect for cloud meant to know? Why is it different? You know, if I had to go on a vendor technology course, I've learned everything I need to know about cloud. Well, yes, you will, you will learn the technology capability of, of, of a cloud vendor solution, which is great. What I'm talking about in this course is thinking about how do you take the, the best practice practitioners experience and then say well what is the architecture value and proposition I'm trying to implement into the business with that vendor technology and they, they complement each other so these are all of the boxes if you will we start to think about in terms of setting up a cloud environment and um, these are just some of the topics that we talk about in the course from designing that we need to think about the features so as a, as a professional uh, solution, cloud solutions architect you need to think about these things that are shown up on the diagram here how do we start to break that down how do we start to put in a robust managed cloud environment what are the professional aspects of managing that cloud environment and this is, this is just again an example of that Again, uh, one, of my, um, one of my important topics that I've used a lot in my career as a, as a cloud architect over the years is this idea of demand and supply forecasting and planning. Because you're, you're buying or consuming cloud as a service, what you need to do is to look at types of demand and then profile the demand. Is it going to be continuous demand? On step two, is it going to be peaks and troughs? Is it just a one-off project cost? You know, like a, a, a spike, or it could be just a burst cloud, if, you, if you're familiar with the term. And then aggregating those demands and then working out a capacity plan of what was your capacity of the cloud you, you need to plan for, what type of workloads you need to plan for. Then from the consumer side, is that, well, what's the consumer need? So you look at the, the first part is what type of catalog, what sort of self-service interaction do they need? What sort of user interfaces do they want? How do they want to consume the cloud? Is it a tablet? Is it on your mobile? Or what type of security selection uh, requirements do they have? How do you take their data? Which location are they going to start to use the cloud? What sort of cyber security requirements do they need? And so as we go through this process, we need to start to think about how the demand and supply workloads match the particular deployments and, and cloud service operations. So part of the central piece of this certification course is to start to get you to think about supply and demand matching. Now on virtual uh, virtualization management, you do cover workload design and management and selection. But what I'm talking about here is looking at it from a, a broad business requirements perspective. What type of business capability, capacity do we need? What do we need to do to deliver that? Where, what type of cloud environments do we need to support that? and to match that and make those decisions. We need to look at the business use cases. So these are blue boxes here on this slide. There are really lots and lots of different examples here. But what we have here is this ability to, to really develop um, a number of things from continuous services that we might need. They're always up and ready, email and continuous service and uh, uh, storage and things like that, to maybe specific uh, modernization services to migrate old services to new. We may have um, spot services for project services that you just need to run for short days or, or a week or whatever. You need to start to think about the type of uh, workloads, as I said earlier, about vertical workloads around um, business intelligence and engineering, all those complex workloads that might need business intelligence, large dedicated cloud databases and computations that you see in big data. So those are unique to the vertical workloads as we categorize them. And then on the other side is lots of small, lightweight web services which are doing 
transactional services in say payments or in supply chain transactions which are what we call horizontal services or well, what I have here is this concept called diagonal work services where we can start to create services that run across combinations of those through portals and collaboration and self-service so where's this all heading to what's the future of this um, a good question I suppose um, rhetorically speaking is that as I said at the beginning of my, introdu you know, my introduction, that I've, I've constantly amazed at how IT has gone through generations. And it was interesting uh, earlier that there was that they say that IT tends to go from at one point in a decade, IT may be going ahead of the business capabilities, and then it, you know, and then it swaps around, and then the business expectations then are ahead of what the IT capabilities can do. So a classic example of that is business process reengineering in the 90s was ahead of what IT was able to do in the 90s enter utility computing in the early 2000s and then by the time we're now in the second decade we now find IT potentially I would say probably potentially more pervasive with social media with mobile computing with sensors and internet things now starting to enter so that now IT maybe the network still needs to be faster than, than we probably would like it to be we now find that IT is now almost ahead of the business capabilities to think about what type of new business models could I do. You just look at what Netflix can do, you just look at what uh, Facebook can do, you just look at what um, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, you look at all these, you know, all these type of new business models, you know, you look at Uber, you look at Airbnb, you look at how, uh, you know, virtual reality or um, lean engineering with uh, putting in new capabilities for um, uh, modernizing organizations. You just look at what you can do now with this kind of new thinking and new technology. It's kind of almost res only restricted by your imagination and obviously restricted by the budgets and investment and skills potential. And I think that's really getting back to the theme of this, this, um, this talk is really how can we move past some of the challenges? How can we define what is the cloud? How do we define what people can do with the cloud? How can we start to understand the sort of capabilities, the potential power that this can bring and you know I'm very passionate about this and I you know, I love this as a, as a kind of subject and I could probably talk for more than the time allotted but it's, it's really getting in behind under the skin of this and really getting to understand how do we measure the value of this what can we do with this kind of capability how can we bring all these benchmarks and risks together and to manage the journey and there are many journeys. As I said, you will, none of you may be looking at getting more into mobile computing. How can I think of mobile apps and how can I build new business capabilities? How can I deploy in a lightweight, low, low training requirement but easy adoption cycle to, to give a digital workforce uh, tablets or mobiles with mobile apps and connected back to the cloud? Um, SAP system, for example. It could be Salesforce. It could be any other system, Workaday, what have you. Or another one might be a bit big data. A lot of you probably will be working on already use of big data and thinking about how does that big data fit in the cloud. Well, you can use obviously cloud to host big data pilots, or projects, and indeed many companies now in the cloud are, are streaming big data services, and you can start to analyze that and offer that as a service. And indeed, with artificial intelligence and AI now, it's uh, moving into uh, the Internet of Things and the connection of sensors, heat, proximity, uh, movement, uh, lots of other types of sensors starting to come into potentially the next era of, of connected services. Crowdsourcing, you know, how do we use crowd uh, to connect through the cloud to collaborate and, and create new capabilities? How do we use open source? And then maybe the infrastructure, you know, what is our infrastructure cost today? What can we do to migrate from a physical infrastructure to a cloud infrastructure? What are the type of savings? How can we become more lean, agile, and capable in, in that shift in mindset and capability? What are the investment costs? So really, the world that we're now moving into uh, is what I call the exabyte world, the zettabyte world even, or beyond. We're now looking at a lot of connected infrastructure, what we call connected business, connected cars, connected retail, connected banking, connected finance, connected health, connected retail, connected this, that, and the other. Lots of alternative models, lots of different channels, lots of data value, the values in the data, not just the transactions. And really what's happening now is that the role of the business solution, uh, sorry, the, the cloud solutions architect 
is to imagine better, to imagine what can be done with all of this kind of capability. And um, it's, it's exciting times, and there's a lot at stake here because it is a disruptive technology. Cloud is disruptive, and it's becoming more disruptive. It can become so in the sense that cloud is, is a fabric, an enabler to think about how you connect your business together in a different way. And this kind of imagination is now real because you can do so many things with the cloud as a, faint, as a back, 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 uh, footprint that allows you to start to put over the top services, to start to bring your different uh, people together to collaborate, to collaborate online in real time through, to, through virtualization. So it's not all, all roses, and just the last few slides as we come towards the end of the session is around scale, commercialization, and cyber. So a lot of companies are, are wanting to try and become faster and more agile with the cloud, but often just putting in your products into a catalog or moving your IT from virtualization into a on-demand service. You still need to think about, well, how can I get more business people, or users, and customers, and suppliers to use my cloud platform? That's the role of the architect to help that happen. Commercialization. You know, there are lots of different pricing models out there, lots of subscription models. Or how could you monetize your big data service in the cloud? How can you actually reverse that? I remember a few years ago when I was at, a, at my previous company where uh, we were talking to a well-known uh, Swedish car manufacturer, you probably can guess who they might be, and uh, they were talking to us about hosting a cloud platform, and they turned around halfway through the meeting and said, well, actually, we just want you to host it, but actually we, we want to then start selling our data on top of your cloud platform back to our partners, back to our, our suppliers. And I said, well, what's happening here? And what happened was that there was a shift in position between the cloud hoster was becoming almost just a vehicle, a vessel, just to host data, and that the customer was then becoming the provider. The customer could, like the automotive company, could then sell their data back to partners to start to monetize and, and play a different role, not just as a consumer of the cloud, but they could also be a provider of cloud services on top of the cloud themselves. And for me, that was a complete reverse of, of roles and that the cloud that enables you to think about business models that you could probably could only imagine before. The cloud is a platform that allows you to start to think about how you can operate your business in a different way to actually become more commercial, if you wish, or more collaborative. SMEs, lots of things there. Freemium to one-stop shop solutions available now widely. Larger, there's lots of trade-offs between standard and shared services. A large um, case study that I did with a very large uh, pharmaceutical company in America um, was about how would they use the cloud to become a hybrid cloud because they needed to have lots of local specialist centers around the world for their medical trials, but equally they needed to have strong, secure, private data research center, uh, data, uh, private clouds in secure locations to protect the privacy and security of of highly sensitive um, research data and, and medical data. So they were implementing a kind of, um, if you will, um, structure around um, uh, hybrid public and private cloud. And so again, lots of complex um, shared service models there. Partner models, multi-layers, um, one throat to choke, which is an English uh, uh, phraseology colloquialism, which is, if you think about it, in the example is you can have a uh, your cloud storage and your cloud compute with one provider managing the data centers, then you could have a network telecoms provider managing your on-demand uh, cloud network, telecoms network, and then you could have application providers offering software as a service as a third type of cloud provider, and then you might have, say, mobile devices, uh, BYOD cloud providers as another layer on top of that. So what you have is a multi-layered cloud architecture with multiple partners. And then the question is, with a, with IT, with it, ITIL or serve, software, you know, service uh, help desk, is which particular vendor, if something goes wrong, do you have to talk to? Is it the network cloud provider? Is it the, the data center at the bottom? Or is it actually the device cloud? So you have all these kind of very interesting new challenges about multiple cloud environments and how do you manage the service back-to-back -back between all of that. 
DDoS, cyber security, issues around that. You know, there's loads, loads and loads of things that I, I regularly talk about in my blogs and, and various things. But again, another aspect, there is actually another uh, cloud uh, credentials council course, I think, uh, from memory that, that covers cyber. But as an architect, we do need to cover this, and we do cover this on, on our, our, our particular module here uh, on our course thinking about how does cyber security change with cloud so you think about backup and recovery if you're moving that to a public cloud are they doing backup and recovery because you've moved the responsibility to them if you will do they do encryption standards what encryption standards do we need how do we do single sign-on how do we do authentication what type of security and reliability what are the contracts in place what about legal requirements around intellectual property so as a, as a solution cloud solution architect while you're not a lawyer you need to be able to ask those commercial and legal questions in order to have a robust enterprise solution architecture. So um, let me just get back to the slides, if it will let me go on to the next one. Uh, and it's just, uh, just trying to move it on. If only it would move on. There it is. So we have lots and lots of new models coming out. So I was reminded uh, last week with a workshop I was running with a with a, a financial services company that their disintermediation model, where they could disintermediate using the cloud, let just move back to the previous slide, uh, was really around understanding how to orchestrate uh, services. But now they're realizing that the world is changing, that they need to resell their data, for example. And so they're now moving into becoming an aggregator of data. They become a data broker. A very interesting case at uh, one of the university lectures that I saw recently in a London um, London Business School was around the idea that when you look at a credit rating system or credit rating company, they're actually not just rating credits, they're actually looking at the way in which um, services need to be um, managed and delivered uh, through data. Again, the technology is changing. I won't go into too much detail here because we need to move on, but um, looking at micro containers, Docker, other micro clouds is potentially the future where this is all going, Internet of Things machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, unified computing, lots of other things we need to start to think about. How do we grow our ecosystem of services? Governance is changing. Um, just to summarize again, we've got lots of different types of capabilities we need to think about. We may be involved in innovation labs. How do we develop those? Lots of other performance issues that we still have into I.O. issues. So if you're using a, private, a public cloud, is the response time fast enough? So how can you design different locations of the cloud? What type of catalog of services and APIs? And then not everything moves to the cloud. Legacy IT might not need to move to the cloud or might be not cost, cost effective to do that. So a lot of workloads may be better placed in a private infrastructure or maybe just used in a temporary cloud before it's decommissioned. So last slide, I think, before I um, finish off here, is that what I hope you've uh, got a, a fairly um, fairly brisk, um, try to be as fast as I possibly could with the, with the scope of the subject. Really, the, the foundation that the um, certification course gives you here, the uh, Professional Cloud Solutions Architect um, uh, Certificate gives you, is then the foundation that is complementary, complementary to vendor, uh, professional vendor technology cloud certifications as well. It's not a replacement of it, it works in synergy with it, but it gives you, if you think of this as a professional practitioner's best practice course that you can then apply to your technical skills and technical uh, certification if you choose to go into that as well. So that was really, really where I want to leave it and I think that is the last slide I believe uh, I'm not quite sure but I think it is uh, Tristan if you could confirm it is the last slide but it is kind of where we go with this journey and I am happy to stop at this point um, if there are any other questions or any questions people would like to explore yeah Mike uh, I'm happy question to from the audience Mike can you hear me mm-hmm Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what kind of technical and business knowledge would you say is critical for leading a company through the transition to a digital enterprise? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, well, technical is that you need to be able to ask the type of data security um, 
standards do you want? So, just very briefly, is technical. So, one a recent project that I was involved in is trying to classify data into public data and private data, and to know the standards that you would want to put in place on that. Because if you then think about it, if data then if it's very private data, you might want to move it to a private cloud. So, one of the core technical skills of an architect you need to be is around data standards and data management. Another one is around um, device management and sensors and the sorts of sort of data that you and how you're going to present the data. What ch what channels, technical channels, do you want to deliver that to? Another technical one would be around uh, customer experience design, which is um, because you said a digital business was the question. Is you need to think about cloud as a kind of enabler to customer experience. So you look at the customer journey. So how does the customer journey work with the cloud? How many clouds does the customer journey connect with? And then you asked me just very briefly about uh, the business, critical business skills. I would say that what you need to understand is really, I would say, the difference between CapEx and OpEx. So you need to have some knowledge of finance, not, a, not an accountant level of knowledge, but you need to know what is the business value of cloud? How can I reduce my CapEx investment? How can I speed up my, op my OPEX, and you know, get a, a faster return on investment, break even if I move to a cloud agile environment? Another couple of quick answers, just very quickly, is about agile. agile. A lot of architects here may be involved in agile, or you may be going on a course learning agile. You need to think about how does cloud characteristics work with your business processes? How does sales change with cloud? How does marketing change with cloud? How does my operations management change with cloud? How does security change with cloud? How does my business process change with cloud characteristics? And I guess the final critical business capability that was you know, yesterday when I was talking to um, a master's group, a master's students at Warwick University Business School, was this idea that you remember the role of the architect is to be the eyes and ears and the voice of IT. And what I mean by that is be able to articulate the vision of the cloud, the vision of what this can do for your organization, and to bring all of these things together so you can bring the executive, you can bring community, you can explain the value of this and the reason why this can create new value and capability for your organization. So to be able to articulate the big picture thinking is, I would say, a, a unique, important skill that the architect brings to the party. Thank you, Mark. I have another question from the audience, and is will an experienced enterprise architect have much trouble shifting to cloud architecture? And with means in mind, they want to say, what will be the biggest hurdle, knowledge gap? Well, I would say that if they're experienced, they probably already have all of the skills to to talk. I think it's just um, going back to I can give you a very well, sort of an architect answer to it is understanding the different types of architecture principles that as a as a experienced architect you need to work to. So when I mean by architecture principles, cloud architecture principles, I would advise them to write those down and to try to think differently. So think about um, elastic characteristics of agile business processes. Think about how you you're generating new types of customer experience using sensors or mobile computing and how the cloud fabric creates a kind of new capability. I sometimes find with experienced architectures that you know very, very good, but they tend to they, they will probably think more of what we call server huggers or understand how they might architect um, the, the back end of the system, but they may not think about you know the a t a classic criticism of enterprise architects, and I don't agree with this criticism, is that they're all about the back office. I don't think the architect is just about the back office. It's not just about the middle in the middle, about integration as well. I think the modern architect, the modern cloud solutions architect, is all about the front end. It's all about the outcome-based thinking, the design thinking, if you're familiar with that phrase that we start to think about service level outcomes, how I can create better value for customers through on-demand services in the cloud, how I can start to create new value and creative experiences, how can I bring innovation from an app store to my customers and my workforce faster. So if I say so myself, I think that's a good way of answering your question. I would say think front end, drive the back end through, connect it all up and be the modern architect and, and to really drive that through as a vision. Hey, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have time, I think, and questions are over. Uh, so 
thank you again. And I think we are we are done for today. Do you have any any, any things to say anymore? Uh, no, I um, hopefully people have found it useful. Um, I've enjoyed it, and I, I, as I encourage you to to please. Um, obviously, I'm keen for you to go on the course, but I believe this is an important time to be involved in cloud. It's not over yet, and it's just really at the peak of getting to the peak of capability. So I, you know, please, please do um, push forward. And I'm happy to receive emails. If you've got any questions, just drop me in line. I'm, you know, I'm happy to, I don't get an avalanche of questions, but um, please feel free to contact me. I'm happy to to answer questions. If I if I don't know, I probably know a person who does. Who does. So thank you very much, Tristan, and to to um, the Cloud Credential Council for inviting me. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, very much. And yeah, to the audience, please, if you have any question, just visit the cloudcredential.org website or contact the CCC or Mark Skilton on Twitter, and we will we will help you go through every doubt. Okay, I will close the webinar and to the next one. Bye bye.